I'll tell you something about stories, he said. They're not just entertainment, and don't be fooled. They're all we have, you see, all we have to protect ourselves from illness and death. You don't have anything if you don't have the stories. Evil is mighty. Evil is mighty. But not in the shadow of our stories. Some would choose to destroy the stories, confuse them, forget them, or simply say that they just don't matter. If we would let that happen, if we would let that happen, we would be defenseless. Margaret was 54 years old and dying of one of the worst metastatic breast cancers that the Dana-Farber cancer doctors in Boston had ever seen. It was a superficial tumor that was enveloping her, and she had severe pain from her cancer and wounds on her chest. I walked into her room to help as best I could during my training as a pain and palliative care physician. Her devoted husband sat quietly just behind her bed. I made some changes in the medications to help her be more comfortable, and I, and I came back the next day with a medical intern who was training with me to be sure that she was doing better. As we quietly entered the room, we could see that Margaret was much more comfortable, much closer to dying, and her husband was right by her side. After a few moments, I edged a little closer to her, and I softly said, Margaret, you're 54 years old. And she said, yes, I am. And then I said, so Margaret, you've lived 54 years of stories. And she said, yes, I have. And then I asked, so Margaret, of all the stories you've lived, what was one of the best? And she said without hesitation and with one foot in both worlds, when I met him. So I said, how did you meet? And she said that I was a single mother working at a cash register in a local grocery store when he came through the line and asked me out. I wasn't that interested, but he persisted and he wore me down. <laughs> and eventually, I said, okay. So then I said, what did you do? And she said, oh, we just went down the street to a local bar for a drink. And then I said, what did you order? And she said, a Guinness. <laughs> and as she's telling this story, as she's sharing this story, there is a palpable change in the energy of the room such that that intern standing right next to me leans over and unprompted whispers in my ear, you know, this is better than any morphine we've given her all day. So the next thing that intern and I did was race out of the hospital and down the street to find the closest liquor store we could <laughs> and find the coldest Guinness and the nicest pint glasses. And we ran back to that hospital and up the stairs and down the ward and into their room to build them one last Guinness to share together. She died peacefully two days later, her husband right next to her. I'll never forget that moment. It was a moment that began with a question about a story. And I thought to myself, that was a pretty good question. I should ask it more often. I also thought, what if, what if that 
intern was right. What if stories could be better than morphine at the end of life? I also thought that I was an intern once. I was never right. <laughs> but what if that intern was right? <laughs> what if stories could really protect us from illness and death? What an absurd idea. But I love absurd ideas, and I thought that I should check it out. So what I did was that I found a group of patients dying of cancer, and I asked them, of all the stories you've lived, what was one of the best? And I looked at their ratings of sense of well-being, as well as sense of pain, and I compared that to another group of patients dying of cancer, where I did not engage with their story. I did not ask them, of all the stories you've lived, what was one of the best? And what I found was interesting. As far as well-being, and each of these lines represents one patient during the time they were with me. You can see that ratings for the controls, the patients where we didn't engage in stories, their sense of well-being did not change. But if you engage with patients where you engage with their story, their sense of well-being, their ratings change significantly. Well, what about pain? What about pain? For the controls, the same thing. Nothing much happened. But if you engaged with the best story of their lives and deepened that story, what we saw was that pain scores changed significantly. Even what we say is neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain, very difficult from tumor invading nerves themselves. There were significant changes. And so you might ask, well, if these stories could account for those changes, if those stories could account for those changes, well, what were the stories they told? What, what are the best stories of dying patients? And so what I did was that I kept track and I titled each of the stories told to me. And these are some of the examples of what was shared. Title themes. When we first met, Cheese and Crackers with Mother, Piano Concert Series in Boston, Family Vacations in Cape Cod, Wedding Day, and Daughter's Success with Schizophrenia, The Day I Got Married, Stories of My Five Children, Infant Son Dancing MTV Style, who's now in Berkeley, Adoption of Twins After 12 Years, Instant Family Singing with Children, My Wedding Day, Snowmobiling in Canada made the list. Marrying my wife when we first met. Well, these stories really fall into four categories. They fall into categories of activities. They fall into categories of family, spouse, spouse and activities. But for the most part, all of these stories are about one thing in general. They're about one thing. They're really about reaching through sacred space to find the magic of connection with those we love. When not much more matters, when not much more matters, that's what matters most. That space, that sacred space between. A while back, I shared some sacred space with a stoic Irishman with a great sense of humor and his family in exam room 14 of our cancer center, Mr. O'Donnell. We had met when he was in the hospital weeks before with severe pain from his pancreatic stage four cancer. Mr. O'Donnell and I, we had a deal. I would help him with his pain. And he would help me perfect my Irish accent. <laughs> Thankfully, his pain got better quite quickly. Sadly, my Irish accent didn't. 
But he turned to me and he said, in the only way that an Irishman could, he said, you know, lad, you gave it your best try, and that's the most important thing. He'd be happy to hear that. <laughs> Mr. O'Donnell was much weaker now, and time was getting short. He was reflective of his life and the love of his family. We now talked about how hospice could be of great benefit to him and his family as well. The mood was somber but had clarity in the moment for Mr. O'Donnell. He even hummed a little Irish tune from his childhood, and his eyes brightened a bit at the end. I waited a moment or two, and then I turned to him in the best Irish that I could muster, and I said, and so, Mr. O'Donnell, would you be so kind and willing to share with us a wee bit of a song? And he looked at me, and he looked at his family, smiled, took a breath, and began to sing. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry I have to stop for a minute um, I have to tell you a secret I'm not a very good singer <laughs> just ask my 10-year-old daughter and my 7-year-old son, you know, the ones with the rolling eyes, Dad, are you singing? But they also teach me what they learn in school, important lessons. And they've said to me, Dad, if you ever need some help, all what you have to do is ask. So perhaps, perhaps, we all could give it our best try together because that's the most important thing. And we might just conjure up a wee bit of magic such as would bring a smile to the face of a stoic Irishman and honor and memory of his story. Are you all with me? This is your moment. This is your moment. Let's just find a note together. Mm, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From glen to glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and all the roses falling. It's you, it's you must go and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow.
As he finished, as he finished, his voice hung in the air and echoed throughout the examination room as tears streamed down the faces of all present and spilled over into the cancer center itself. Nurses and staff paused in the midst of his singing. Mr. O'Donnell got up slowly, came over to me, reached out his hand, and shook mine hard and long, and then let go. He said goodbye, turned, and left with his family. Hard to find words for moments like that. I believe those moments, like the ones with Mr. O'Donnell and Margaret, lie beyond the constructs of medicine and healthcare. It's really about how we choose to approach life. There are windows available to us to open if we pay attention to our shared humanity and the sacred spaces between one another. Perhaps we could even consider it the creative space of performance art that we have the opportunity to engage with each other each day on the grand stage of what matters most. Encounters that always contain elements of the unknown, opportunities to shapeshift experience, and creative process that finds its own way in the midst of life's mystery and in the magic of our stories. I will tell you something about stories, he said. They're not just entertainment and don't be fooled. <laughs>